Well, first of all, let me welcome you all to the final session of this afternoon event, uh, Japan's Security Relationships. Uh, my name is Bill Heinrich. I am the Northeast Asia Division Chief for the Bureau of Intelligence and Research in the State Department. Uh, I am usually on a very tight leash. Uh, today will be a little different. However, I still must make the standard disclaimer. Anything I say does not reflect official government positions in Washington, D.C. It reflects my positions. So with that uh, out of the way, uh, I will say uh, just to begin that I would not have this august position at the State Department uh, were it not for uh, three people uh, who are all of whom present today. Uh, one of whom is Jerry Curtis, uh, another of whom is Hugh Patrick, and a third of whom is James Morley. Uh, in my uh, private moments, I would refer to them as uh, the, uh, the, the, the Columbia Triumvirate. And they were the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit <laughs> to me. I did not assign particular roles, so I'm probably guilty of some sort of Catholic heresy. However, I'm not Catholic, so it doesn't matter. Um, but I would just like to say how uh, important uh, my Columbia education was uh, to me. Um, and it wasn't just the fact that I had these three stellar people. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting today because um, when I uh, uh, have my opportunities to talk to other members of the intelligence community about Japan, they're kind of struck by the fact that I managed to cover domestic politics in Japan, foreign policy in Japan, and the economy in Japan, and they say, how did you ever manage to get such a broad education in Japanese affairs? And I will tell them, the Father, the Son, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit. Uh, it has been uh, certainly a privilege for me. Um, I would also, you know, it, it, really having those three was, was a great thing, but I also had an, an, an amazing cohort of fellow PhD students. I think that's really what gave uh, the plus alpha to my uh, Columbia education. And, uh, you know, a couple of them are here up on, uh, up on the, the dais with me, and many more of them are out in the audience. Um, but let me uh, offer my uh, compatriots here the same opportunity <laughs> that, that, uh, that I've had to, to make a, a kind of a, a personal reflection. Uh, let me start with Victor Cha, because Victor, uh, did something very important for me very early on in my political science education at Columbia. He gave me all of his notes to Doug Chalmers' comparative politics class. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me what I am today. <laughs> so, Victor, please. Um, well, thanks, Bill. And uh, I'll just add to the chorus of appreciation um, to Jerry Curtis for, um, for all that he's done for all of us. Um, uh, this is a especially special for me because um, uh, Columbia is, it's my home. I did my PhD here. I did my BA here um, with a fellow by the name of Barry Obama at the time. <laughs> he graduated the same class. His career's gone a little bit better than mine, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, it's just different. Uh, it's just different. Yeah, it's just different. And um, and I actually grew up on 110th Street in Riverside, so I used to play on this campus when I was a kid. So this really is um, um, coming home for me. Um, uh, I think we're all allowed a couple of Jerry stories, so I'll I'll tell um, two very quickly. The first is that um, um, well, this actually involves both Jerry and Jim Morley. Um, I was, I came back to Columbia for graduate work and I started in SEPA, the SEPA program. I finished the first year, did pretty well and got a fellowship for my second year. I also applied to the PhD program in my first year at SEPA and was accepted, but with a smaller fellowship. So I went to Jim and Jerry and I said, 
uh, I really like SEPA, but I really want to do a PhD, but there's a difference in the money. And I'll never, they both said, all right, well, let's go down and talk to them about it. So we went down to the political science department and, uh, you know, and lo and behold, I was in the PhD program. And I walked away from that interaction saying, I better stick with these guys. <laughs> um, but in, in uh, Jerry's case, the, one of the first courses I took on Asia was his Japanese politics course. And one of the first books I read about Asia and Asian politics was election campaigning Japanese style. And Jerry, you may not remember this, but um, I, I read that book. And when I finished it, I said, uh, this is what I'm do. I want to do a PhD, and I want to write, I want to write books like this. So um, I went to you <laughs> during office hours, and I said, um, I want to do a PhD, and I want to write this book, and I want to call it Election Campaign in Korean Style. <laughs> <laughs> and you looked at me, and you said, get ready to do a lot of drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for that book. Right, right. Yeah, that book's not. Yeah, that book's not coming out. So. <laughs> but um, uh, seriously, the uh, as, as some of you know, I, I left academia for three years to serve in the U.S. government um, um, on the National Security Council. And um, when I came out of that, um, I think it would be fair to say that not the entire academic community was welcoming of a of an academic, a scholar who went to government, uh, worked for a particular administration, and then came out. Um, and so, you know, there were some people that were indifferent. There were some people that were actually quite hostile. But I'll never forget, as soon as I got out, the first invitation I got to come and speak was by Jerry, to come and speak at Columbia, at the faculty house, before uh, an audience. And, and for me, I'll never forget that. And I'll always remember that. And, uh, and I'm very thankful for that and for everything that you've done. Thanks. Uh, let me now turn to uh, uh, Bob Uriu, who, uh, among other things, sat on my dissertation committee. Uh, the check is in the mail. <laughs> Bob, please. Uh, I sure hope my voice holds out. Um, so let me do my Jerry stories. Um, Everybody this morning talked about being terrified and, of course, knowing that you're going to get grilled when you go in. We were so terrified, we would, before going to see him, we would stop by his secretary's desk and say, what kind of mood is he in? <laughs> like, like did, did he, was he smiling this morning? So you just kind of knew what kind of you know, treatment you were going to get, even though you knew it was going to be harsh. Okay. But... Uh, so some of you may know I joined the faculty uh, after I did my PhD here. And so very quickly, I got to see him on the other side of the table. In other words, when he was grilling you folks, right? You probably don't know that, you know, he, after he would grill you, he would have that impish grin that we all know now. <laughs> but back then, we didn't, right? We were just like so terrified of you, I think. So I don't know if I would say he enjoyed grilling people, um, but I would say I think that because he knew that you all can handle it, we all can handle it, that, and that we would pass, you know, that he was going to be as tough as he possibly could. So I appreciate that so much more now, I guess, than, than at the time, as Aki was saying, <laughs> the, 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 the emotional scars. But anyway, I do want to thank you, Jerry. You did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you've, you've really been an inspiration, I think, to all of us, um, so thank you. Uh, finally, we have uh, Young Ho Kim uh, at Yonsei University. Uh, I'm yeah. just going to say one thing. I never had the pleasure of meeting you at Columbia, but uh, when I saw your name on my panel, I immediately called Victor, and I, and I asked him, so who's this guy, Young Ho Kim? What's he like? And, and Victor said to me, wrote back to me quickly and said, oh, I played basketball with him. Great guy. <laughs> so I, I, I have to believe... He's a good basketball player, and he's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, I recollect it was in 1987, uh, as a first semester graduate student at Columbia, I took his course, uh, Japanese politics. And it was right after uh, the year 1986, when uh, Japanese defense expenditure uh, somehow technically exceeds uh, 1.000%. And at the time, uh, he mentioned that this might be a meaningful step uh, toward 
uh, long-term Japanese rearmament, uh, rearmament. At the time, rearmament, the word rearmament was uh, mostly used. Uh, so uh, he mentioned that uh, we still need a uh, uh, careful and uh, further observation. And after that, several years later, uh, the concept of normal state came out of Tsunokuni. And then now we hear Japan is back and the uh, first tire countries. So uh, if I add one more flattery to Professor Gerald Corris, then uh, how enlightening his courses were. And uh, that was uh, still vivid in my memory. And still he mentioned uh, to the students that uh, uh, don't worry about grades. Everybody will get a good grade. So one student asked, uh, what do you mean by saying good grades? And he said, oh, B plus or above. <laughs> so at that time, I didn't agree with you. But now, as a 50-year-old professor, I totally agree with you. B plus is a very good grade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, I was looking at the title of this conference, uh, and uh, is Japan really back? And I don't think anyone's made uh, the connection. I mean, the connection to me is perfectly obvious. It goes back to when uh, Prime Minister Abe first came to the United States after his, uh, the, the beginning of his second tenure as Prime Minister. And in his first public speech, he said, Japan is back. So we have an answer from him. We, he believes Japan is back and that he has been leading the charge. And we've heard this, you know, this afternoon um, that on the economic side of things, well, OK, he talks a good game. <coughs> it seems like a good plan. But maybe the reality is a little bit different. And maybe, as Hugh Patrick suggests, the problems weren't as bad as some people believed anyway. But we'll give him some credit uh, for at least coming out of the box talking about the economy, because he, he obviously learned a lesson from his first tenure as prime minister. Um, incidentally, his first tenure as prime minister almost was a perfect overlap of my stay in Japan as a Mansfield Fellow. I came in early September of 2006, and I left uh, at uh, 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 in September of 2007. I had a, a, a I was just say by the by, a wonderful uh, opportunity to work in the for Japanese Foreign Ministry, to work with uh, Konotaro, a Diet member, and to work in the uh, then uh, first year Ministry of Defense. So it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I learned an awful lot. Uh, it was kind of finishing school after Columbia, perhaps. Um, but. The fact that Mr. Abe only lasted one year during, uh, and that it perfectly overlapped, I, I sort of, I, I basically dismissed him. I said, oh, he's another one of these, you know, one year wonders. Uh, we're never going to see him again. Uh, and, you know, in my heart of hearts, and don't quote me on this, uh, in my heart of hearts, I thought, Bochan. You know, that's, I thought, he doesn't have the, in and he really didn't have the intestinal fortitude <laughs> to last, you know, uh, you know, to really play politics the way people play politics in Japan. Uh, so I dismissed him. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because when I was first at the foreign ministry, it was interesting because everybody had his book. You know, his book, uh, you know, uh, The Beautiful Japan. And every, it was open to the pages about values diplomacy. And everybody in the foreign ministry was going, what the heck is values <laughs> diplomacy? How the heck are we going to translate into this, translate this idea into policy? It was really, some people, I mean, they spend late nights at the foreign ministry anyway. But you could see them like talking among other, underlying, the underlining passages. But everybody had the book. Um, and yet, again, after a year, gone, I thought, so much for this you know, arc of freedom and prosperity, and all these wonderful ideas he has about uh, maybe not containing China, but at least contesting Chinese influence. So I thought, you know, we're, we're just never going to see uh, anyone really take the, his foreign policy ideas seriously. Well, fast forward. What do we have? Uh, in, in 2012, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, not the people's choice. Here comes, what is it? A second act in Japanese politics. We almost never have a second act in Japanese politics. And here is Mr. Abe again. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this possible? How does this man who you know, could barely get off the ground uh, during his first uh, tenure, how, what's he going to do this second time? 
And I have to say that I have been royally surprised. This man, uh, particularly on foreign policy and security matters, has been nothing short of remarkable. You look at the trips that he's taken, the outreach that he has made, his efforts to kind of turn the defense budget around, his forward-leaningness on TPP and understanding that it's part of our rebalance and a very important part, he gets that. So in many respects, there is, uh, you know, at least on foreign policy and defense matters, a Mr. Abe that we can really, at least down in Washington, can really look to as a partner. And uh, in fact, I said to, to someone down in Washington, D.C. at one point, really, Mr. Abe wants to be our best friend you know, in East Asia. That's what he wants. He's, he's, he's pulling out the stops for you. So um, that's what I would call the good Mr. Abe. But there's another Mr. Abe. I might call him the bad Mr. Abe. <laughs> Some people might call him the revisionist Mr. Abe. But he is a, an unrepentant uh, nationalist. He believes very deeply that Japan's 20th century history has been written wrongly and that he is going to take a page <coughs> Uh, you know, from his uh, grandfather's generation and turn things around and rewrite history and make Japan a, a country that its young people can be proud of, who can be, feel a sense of patriotism. And, you know, on the face of it, some of that isn't necessarily bad, but there are some aspects that really, within East Asia, rub other countries very uh, very wrongly, uh, you know, I think particularly of South Korea, I think particularly of China. Uh, the two countries that Japan really needs to have uh, as a middle power, needs to have solid relationships with, it doesn't. Uh, it has a very troubling relationship with South Korea, and it has uh, an equally troubling relationship with China. Um, and these don't seem to be going away very quickly. So on the one hand, down in Washington, we like to, you know, we, we, we look at many of the things that he has done in foreign policy and his outreach to Australia, his outreach to India, his outreach to countries around the South China Sea, and we say, that's great, go for it. And then when he talks about history, we kind of hold our breath and hope that he doesn't put his foot in his mouth. <laughs> so we have that kind of, that the, those two faces constantly at work when we think about, about Mr. Abe. And I want to explore some of those faces with, with, the, with the panelists here. And I think there is no one better qualified to talk about the Japan ROK relationship than this man right here. If you have read his PhD dissertation, which became a book, it's all about that subject. I keep telling people, really, if you want to know what's going on, read this man's book. And so I offer to Victor Cha the opportunity to perhaps give some remarks on what you think is happening in the Japan ROK relationship, how that may influence the United States, and what the future may hold for us. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Bill. Um, so what was it you said? The good and the bad, right? The good and the bad. I didn't include ugly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, um, so let me make a, like three quick points to get the discussion started. The first, I think, is um, <coughs> in terms of the overall U.S.-Japan alliance, um, you know, there are many things that I think this administration in Washington and others like about what Abe is doing, particularly, as you said, on TPP and on some, some of the security issues. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of very vocal support for Japan on these sorts of things. And there really is silence on the history issue, the so-called nationalist uh, his, or history issue. I think there's silence on the surface, um, and I think uh, there's silence on the surface, there's some discomfort, and I think privately there's general opposition, uh, although that would never be stated publicly. Um, I think much of what uh, Prime Minister Abe is doing fits very well within the role that the United States has always envisioned for Japan, going back to 
um, George Kennan and John Foster Dulles. My next book actually is about uh, Kennan and Dulles and how they thought about Asia at the beginning of the Cold War. And you look at the way they thought about Japan and, and many of the things that Abe is doing now fit very much into that role that, um, that uh, the United States has historically wanted Japan to play. Uh, but at the same time, there is, um, I think Sheila mentioned it earlier, it's, there's almost a re role reversal now because you know, for the first time probably ever in the US-Japan relationship, there is on the U.S. side, you know, a not, you know, a residual concern about entrapment, about getting pulled into something, you know, perhaps a direct Sino-Japanese conflict that the United States is not prepared for, and the United States doesn't know what's going to be asked of it. Um, the, uh, the, ex the, the question I ask, I always ask all of my Japan friends is, um, uh, as, you know, as all of you know, in 2010, North Korea sunk a South Korean naval vessel killing 46 sailors. And so I always ask my Japan friends, what do you think would be the demands on the alliance if a Chinese and Japanese submarine collided in the East China Sea and you had scores of Japanese sailors losing their lives? What would be, where would the alliance be in a situation like that? So I think with every good, you know, it comes, uh, you know, with any, every good and every a step an alliance makes comes, you, you know, new liabilities, new questions start to arise. And I think that's cer certainly the case in the U.S.-Japan relationship. On the region, I, there are others here, so let me just talk about um, um, Korea. And I'll, I'll, I'll spin off the point you made about putting your foot in your mouth. Because, so, um, when I was in government, I worked with, uh, with um, Prime Minister Abe when he was, um, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary or Chief Cabinet Secretary for Koizumi <coughs> and then for the year that he was Prime Minister I was I was there and so you know I've known him I've, I've, I've had dinner with him and I genuinely think that he wants to have good relations with Korea I mean I think he genuinely in his heart he wants to have good relations and so that first trip that he took to Washington he gave a speech at CSIS and as you can imagine, the Japanese embassy was very concerned about the speech, not the speech, but about the question and answer period. So they very politely asked, um, could we see the questions maybe <laughs> that you're going to be asked? And uh, 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 Mike Green, who was organizing this, said, sure, sure. And then we gave them a set of questions. And then they said, these look OK. Might we ask who might be asking these questions? <laughs> and. Um, so to make a long story short, the agreement was that Victor Cha would ask the question about Japan-Korea relations. So he, after he said to the folks in the audience that Japan is back, we went to the question and answer period and said, uh, first question for, um, uh, for Professor Cha from Georgetown. So I got up and I said, Prime Minister Abe, what is your forward-looking vision for positive Japan-Korea relations? You can't throw a bigger softball than that. <laughs> and he was ready for the question because, you know, he does believe in the strong relationship. And he said, Korea, uh, my grandfather, Kishi, and President Park's father, Park Jung-hee, were good friends, very good friends. And that's, that's the kind of relationship that I want to have. So again, I think heartfelt. Just the wrong <laughs> phrases to use. Right? So, um, so I do think that, uh, and, and for a variety of reasons that we can go, on in, go into, almost a, in many ways a comedy of error, it makes you really believe in path dependency, uh, this relationship got off to a very bad start and has had a very difficult time uh, recovering. I think the real challenge, there, there are two real challenges for both the U.S.-Japan and U.S.-Korea alliances right now, at least from a U.S. perspective, because one of my, when I was at the NSC, I did both Japan and Korea and was responsible for both alliances, including Australia. Um, the, we, we talk about both of these alliances as global alliances, that they have made an incredible evolution from where they started in the early 1950s to where they are today, and that both Japan and Korea as partners operate on the global stage with the United States, whether it's on development assistance, peacekeeping, uh, climate, uh, clean energy, all these sorts of things. 
But where both of these alliances have a terrible problem is they can, they can have a great global alliance, a great bilateral alliance with the United States, but regionally, right, there's regionally both of them have a great deal of difficulty, regionally. And in particular between Korea and Japan, aside from the history problems and, and things, of it, the, the thing that worries me the, the most is that we're at a moment where both uh, the Koreans and the Japanese are discounting the strategic value of each other. Um, uh, you see this certainly on the Korean side where um, they are unwilling to share information, right? Trilateral information sharing agreements. Uh, they, uh, we've been involved in some track two diplomacy trilaterals where we've run gaming where the Koreans don't want to talk to the Japanese. So there's a clear uh, um, view that J J Japan is not important to Korea, and in fact, the big game for Korea now is China, right? Trying to move China more closer to Korea when it comes to particularly the North Korea problem. And that's why you see Park Geun-hye signing a free trade agreement with China, going to the Victory Day celebrations and standing with Putin and Xi Jinping and all these sorts of things. Um, and then on the Japanese side as well, the thing that concerns me is um, uh, many of you are familiar with the phrase Korea fatigue. There's a lot of Korea fatigue in Japan, even, mo even among um, um, colleagues in government who are very pro uh, trilateral relations, US, Japan, Korea, very pro relations. There's just a lot of fatigue. Um, and uh, this fatigue is coming at a time where Japan's attention has been drawn to other places, right? The East China Sea and the South China Sea. Meanwhile, while, while this is happening, right, this separation is happening, North Korea is sitting in the basement, right, churning out more nuclear weapons, uh, more capable nuclear weapons, uh, uh, really seeking to develop a sophisticated uh, nuclear program. And so from a U.S. perspective, this gap is worrying. Uh, it's not closing as much as quickly as we would like it to close. Uh, and it may, it, and one doesn't want a crisis of some sort to be the moment at which everyone realizes we've got to consolidate the trilateral relationship. I think we would like that to happen sooner than a crisis. Uh, but the indicators right now are not that positive. Can I just, just let me just ask one quick follow up. Yeah. Let's suppose that a Republican becomes president <laughs> and you are called back to the State Department <laughs> to handle Huh. East Asian affairs. <clears throat> How would you over, what would you do to try to overcome this gap, this strategic gap that you see between <laughs> Japan and Korea? What could be done? You, so you want me to answer this question with the camera rolling, right? <laughs> 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 For the Trump administration, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I never said. Build a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Let's build a wall. <laughs> Right, build the wall. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it, I mean, it's a, it's, it's. A, I think it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I think that um, uh, the. I don't think that. Let's put it this way. I don't think the current administration has done anything wrong in terms of um, trying to get its allies together. In fact, I think it's been working over time. So I don't know how much of it is a, is a function of U.S. effort um, to try to bring the two together. You know, clearly there are bilateral issues there. Um, you know, and I think we may be at a point where, you know, between um, President Park and Prime Minister Abe, you know, maybe we won't get back to a normalization of the trilateral relationship until we have different leadership. That might very well, uh, very well be the case. Not because not to fault one or the other, but you know, as far as we've come, it's difficult for me to see, for example, some of these historical issues being resolved under these two leaders. And it may be something that have to, it might have to wait till, uh, till the next leadership. So how's that for a non-answer? Excellent. So. You, you will go far. You already have gone far. Um, let me uh, now turn to, uh, to, to Bob Odiu, and we'll hope that his voice holds out. Um, I mentioned earlier about TPP. Uh, and I think, you know, at least in the United States, we sometimes forget that um, 
the Japanese have a little bit different approach to national security. It's a much more encompassing concept for them. It's one that includes particularly economic ties uh, and trade and human security. They have a whole raft of, of alternatives to kind of uh, hard military power that they will pull out to uh, increase their influence, uh, particularly in East Asia. And Bob is someone who's done a lot of work on, uh, on trade issues. Uh, and so I wanted to turn to him and ask him his thoughts on, you know, perhaps on, J on Prime Minister Abe's approach, and maybe whether this, his kind of turn to a, uh, a harder security is actually undermining some of the softer, in fact, Peng Arlam said earlier that, you know, Japan is highly respected uh, in Southeast Asia, and one of the reasons I think that it is highly respected is it doesn't have a military. And so it doesn't, it's not going to come down hard uh, the way the United States or China might come down. So uh, I'll just ask Bob to maybe illuminate some of uh, the other sides of, of national security. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit at the beginning and talk a little bit about the broader security environment. We really haven't talked about it much. And I'm not sure sort of what the consensus is here in the Northeast American Corridor in Washington, D.C., but in my circles, I'm out in Los Angeles now. When we talk about East Asia, it's always China, the China threat. We're going to have a power transition, the Thucydides trap. We're going to have a coming war with China. It's very alarmist. And again, I don't know what the, uh, the feeling is here, but I, did want to I do want to highlight some very strong reasons why that view is absolutely mistaken, in my view, that instead there are some underlying foundational uh, uh, sources of stability in the region. And of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, presence is one. But I want to focus on economics. And I'm not talking so much about interdependence, the way most people talk about it. I'm focusing, actually in my own work right now, on how the nations of, especially Northeast Asia, with the exception of North Korea, by adopting the so-called East Asian model of development, which they've done over the last 40 years, which entailed the governments taking a very active role, of course, in developing industrial capacity and production with an export or an outward-oriented approach, right? In other words, this is so familiar to all of you. But my argument is that there's a very strong security element to that approach. Again, it's not simply interdependence, you know, companies need each other. It's rather the state leaderships committed their countries to a policy of economic growth that relied on its foreign neighbors. Um, and especially if you look at Japan with Korea, later with China, if you look at South Korea with Japan, and if you look at China in 1975 with Japan, with Korea, and others. And this is not <coughs> simply interdependent, the whole, the government basically had staked their policy on this uh, need for markets, need for access to uh, outward sources of, um, of materials, of technology, of finance. So again, I think that is a very important element that I think sometimes gets a little bit lost. I do also think that that it, there's a great deal of continuity there. Of course, you know, China has grown much stronger. It doesn't need its neighbors as much as it used to. But I do think that there is, again, a great deal of continuity in terms of that sort of de developmental mindset. So, uh, you know, I think it's a mistake to talk about security, uh, divorce from economics. I think in the case of Northeast Asia, the two go very much hand in hand and, again, are, I think, a real source of, uh, of stability. Now, um, uh, just a second point here. Uh, you know, I, I agree, Bill. I think U.S.-Japan relations are very, very good. I think Mr. Abe um, has done, I think, a masterful job in sort of making Japan, uh, how did you put it, uh, America's best friend in Asia. I think, uh, you know, just in abstract terms, we Americans love it. You know, it's like, oh, you know, they're going to be a good friend. I worry a bit more about what Victor talked about and that, you know, I, I, I haven't used the word entrapment. I don't think we've gone that far. But I think it is the sense that, you know, Abe has his own um, visions, what he wants to accomplish. And whether those visions are the same as American interests, I do have some doubts. And that brings me to your question about TPP. 
which I am just seeing as essentially, of course, the, the free trade aspects are important, but it, I think, from Abe's point of view, it is really more this idea that in order to be the best friend of, of Asia, Obama needs this TPP. This is something that we're basically going to deliver. Um, but what I, again, worry about is this idea that TPP and some of the other institutions have become so focused on China as in terms of either a battle of prestige or leadership or you know who writes the rules. Um, you know, I think all of that is something that really, uh, I think it, frankly, from my point of view, is quite unnecessary. So, again, I, I do um, think that, in fact, America probably needs to be thinking more about hedging our bets or hedging our alliances. And the idea, again, of sort of joining Japan um, in sort of an anti-China kind of approach, you know, as I said, I think is, uh, is a great mistake. In other words, we have so much, I think, still to accomplish with China, um, and it would be a, a failure of leadership, frankly, if we were to get into some sort of real conflict with China. I, you know, I, I've felt this for many years. I think it is still true today. One final point, and I'll stop. Um, uh, in terms of the IA, IAAB, the uh, uh, Asia, excuse me, AIIP, the Asian Industrial Investment Bank. Um, here again, you know, I think it is being seen as a sort of, you know, is China going to rule Asia? Is the U.S. being kicked out? And I see it a little bit differently. Uh, first of all, I think the bank is really a response to an incredible backlog of, um, of uh, investment projects that have been going unfunded. In other words, uh, the number $8 trillion keeps being floated around by every single person. I don't know where that number came from, but it's this idea that there's a huge backlog, a huge demand <coughs> for investment that the ADB, the World Bank, really have not been quick enough or willing to, uh, to finance. So I think the Chinese are simply um, you know, taking advantage of this sort of demand situation. The way I see the, uh, the debate over the, the bank Though it is, I think, it goes back to this East Asian development model, right? In other words, the extent to which the state is involved, uh, the extent to which, uh, you know, that becomes the focus of, of development. And so I don't see it as a clash of ideologies so much. Um, it is, you know, I think, of course, there are differences, but it's not to the level of, uh, you know, the, again, the, the very alarmist views of, you know, we're going to lose all of our influence in Asia if this bank, you know, becomes successful. I think the U.S. and Japan will continue to be involved in all of these projects. I think they will be um, cooper cooperating with the bank. Uh, so again, much less alarmist. You know, maybe it's been because I've been in California the last 20 years. <laughs> all of a sudden, become uh, so uh, so rosy. Final thing uh, on t TPP. I forgot to mention. Um, you know. It seems to me that if it is successful, and I think it will be, that China is going to join. Um, you know, maybe not now, uh, but you know, I do see it. You know, when it becomes more comfortable with some of the the requirements of TPP, uh, it just seems to be to me to be in China's interest to be not uh, shut out of something like that. So. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, uh, I think if it were just the AIIB. Um, I might be willing to just simply dismiss it. But you look at all of the institutions right. that China has created over the last few years. Right. Uh, I mean, the AIIB is one, uh, this, uh, what is it, RCEP, the trade right. uh, group, mm -hmm. uh, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, you know, th these are, I mean, to me, I think you can make an argument that what the Chinese, I mean, the, in some ways you can say that the Chinese, Chinese feel demonized and to protect themselves what they are doing is creating institutions that kind of push back uh, on U.S. predominance in East Asia. And, you know, I, you know, it's really not a who's guilty kind of question as much as it is the, the Chinese have to protect their interests. And the only way they feel they can protect their interests is to set up institutions where they write the rules instead of having to accept institutions that, where the rules are already written. Yes, but you know, can I go ahead. So, 
again, you know, the, the, the differences in rules, though, again, I just see it as more at the margin, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about communism versus capitalism, that kind of ideological struggle. It does remind me, actually, of the 1980s when we were so worried about Japan kind of rewriting things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that conflict with Japan was overblown then. I think the differences we have with China are overblown uh, today, too. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, uh, one more thing, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> kind of fuzzy here, so Go for it. forgetting all the things I wanted to say. Um, you know, the AIIB, um, you know, as I already said, is based on the developmental state kind of uh, notions, right? Um, and so it's highly ironic to me that Japan actually should have been ideologically completely in favor of the AIIB. In other words, this is what they have done, what they, to a lesser extent, continue to do. Um, I think so that's they, why they're against it. They well, know how good it was for them. <laughs> well, okay. Well, actually, I hadn't thought mm -hmm. about that. But uh, what I, the way I'm seeing it, though, is that their refusal to join is part of this whole, it's China's, and so we're not going to touch it. We in the U.S. are going to basically boycott this thing. And I do find that um, unfortunate that the geopolitics, of course, very important, um, you know, really have sort of change the dynamics, which I think would have been much more positive. Yeah. Um, with that being said. Let me, let me uh, allow Victor just a, a mm -hmm. quick intervention, and then I'm going to ask a real expert on some of these Chinese institutions and someone who knows North Korea as well to talk about the, uh, how Japan is viewed from China and North Korea. So I, would, I mean, I, first on, I, I, would agree with, I would agree with Bob that the, um, uh, the way the U.S. initially dealt with AIB was all wrong. Um, I, practically speaking, I don't think the United States could have joined because Congress never would have approved the money to this <coughs> Congress, would never have approved the money to, to join. But there were, I think, better, uh, better responses than the one that the, the U.S. gave. And it could have been geopolitics, but I also think there's a bureaucratic politics story there that we can talk about later over drinks. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, on the, um, and I would entirely agree with the point you made about institutions. I think. Um, We've seen three waves of institutions in Asia. The first was the alliance system. The next were, was the um, uh, post-financial crisis ASEAN-based system. And in the last decade, what we're seeing is all that China has developed, which is essentially looks like a financial hub and spoke system uh, in, in not developed Asia, but developing Asia, mm -hmm. South, Southwest um, Asia. And then finally on the um, AIB I, I, you know, and these other inst these institutions, I agree, I don't think the rules, in fact, I think the rules will look very similar to uh, <coughs> the other international financial institutes. You know, the real question of the practices, right? Um, because they'll have the right, the boards will look, the, the members of the board will look right and the rules will look right, but the real question will be in sort of the practices uh, that, mm -hmm. that operate in between those rules. Okay, yeah, yeah, go uh, for with it. A, the, with regard to AIAB, mm. uh, China's launch of AIAB uh, can be trade issues, can be political economic issues, but uh, it can be also interpreted as Chinese attempt uh, to construct its own uh, zone of regional influence. I don't mean uh, to reintroduce uh, the uh, tributary, traditional tributary system. However, uh, Chinese attempt to uh, increase is rulemaking, norm making capability <coughs> as a way to influence this uh, Chinese way of uh, you know, soft power. So in terms of soft power, uh, make Chinese policies attractive to the regional states vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan, and how is, how, uh, is Japanese foreign policy uh, attractive to other uh, states in the region? So uh, it, it is sort of a competition, not just between trade issues, uh, but between the how to increase soft power issues. And also, uh, with regard to the uh, uh, Japanese foreign policy, I guess <coughs> Japan faces uh, several puzzles to solve in, the, uh, in dealing with multi-layer diplomatic networks in the region. Uh, of course, Japan has been very active in uh, the multilateral institutions like uh, APEC, uh, East Asia Summit, or ARF. Uh, but uh, the serious puzzle arises from how to deal with the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organizations. SCO was Chinese uh, response toward 
uh, the post 9-11 U.S. foreign policy, which is often termed as unilateralism. Uh, because you know, post 9-11 U.S. policy can be labeled as strategic encirclement of China by increasing uh, U.S. influence in uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, or uh, better relations with India, Taiwan, Korea. So all of a sudden, China felt uh, you know, encircled. So Chinese response was to uh, form uh, Shanghai cooperation organizations with Russia and other uh, Central Asian countries. And under that banner, uh, China and Russia conducted first uh, naval uh, joint exercise in 2005, which has been continued uh, annually with some uh, exceptions. And this year is quite notable that China and Russia conducted, uh, although it's maritime rescue operations, but uh, they conducted joint naval uh, exercise in Europe and in Asia simultaneously, not, uh, although there are some time gaps. So how to deal with SCO is how to deal with the, uh, the newly emerging uh, power plans between uh, intensified security cooperation between Russia and uh, China on the one hand, and on the other, uh, the intensified uh, alliance between Japan and uh, United States. And uh, the, uh, the last puzzle, uh, I can see about Chinese foreign pol uh, the Japanese foreign policies, how to do, uh, how to deal with the uh, six-party talks. Maybe Victor knows uh, much about uh, you know, six-party talks. Uh, although six-party talks you know, fail to stop uh, North Korea's nuclearization, uh, however, six-party talks is the only uh, institution which incorporates all relevant powers of the Far East. So it can have potential uh, to uh, to be developed into. Uh, security community or collective security, especially after the interpretation of Article 9. So uh, how, to, uh, uh, how to develop Japanese uh, role in the future foreign policies uh, toward East Asia is you know, required for the observations. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we've, we've shot our wad a little bit. Now we'll let you shot, shoot yours. Uh, so if we have some, uh, some questions, I will happily uh, entertain them. And I see a gentleman toward the back there with his hand raised. I'm Charlie Kimball with the Korea Center for National Finance. As opposed to the discussion about the East Asian model development, I look at the, the cooperative phase of looking at markets and, and finance as the first part of the, of the East Asian model development. But the second one is you see countries like Korea and Japan are much more competitive with each other in the same products serving the same markets. Sometimes one in one product area, like Korea, overwhelms Japan in <coughs> consumer <coughs> electronics. In another area, they just fight with each other in automobiles for the same markets. And in this process, here comes the big elephant, China, which is going up the value-added curve. And so the question is, if this view of the second phase of the East Asian model development is true, what does that mean for relationships between the three? Uh, sh I guess you want to take a couple. Yeah, you want to take a couple? Do we have a couple of other questions? Please, got two more over here, and then two more over here. Could you keep raising your hand, please? So we uh, thank you, uh, uh, Samuel Song. Uh, it was. Uh, rather hotly discussed about uh, U.S. concerns on uh, disharmony between Japan and uh, Korea. Uh, first of all, uh, U.S. policy toward uh, uh, trilateral relations, there is uh, no question the U.S. is inclined on <coughs> best uh, ally Japan. There are two evidences. First, on February 27 this year, Wendy Sherman's keynote speech at the Carnegie Peace Institute, that's uh, number one. Number two issue is, like uh, Victor Cha, uh, Japan specialist uh, Michael Green, stated publicly last year, 
Dobdo Island is a disputed territory. Those two are clearly indicates U.S. policies inclined on number one U.S. ally Japan. No question but it. Very clear. Having said that, in order for United States to clear the way and uh, make uh, the bilateral relations smooth and uh, uh, resolvable, uh, that is the U.S. Uh, best interest, United States, the great nation, should come forward with the three principles. Number one, the truth, the justice, and the fairness. It is lacking in U.S. policy. As I said, Wendy Sherman's public keynote speech, Michael uh, Green's uh, disputed territory, so on, I termed the situation Second top to Gajira conspiracy. It is a very serious matter. Wrong U.S. policy should change it. U.S. Could, policy could should we get come to forward. the other two principles that you mentioned? Pardon? You said you had three principles. <laughs> I'm sorry. You said you had U.S. should come forward with three principles. Right. I already said truth, justice, truth, justice, and, and fairness. fairness. Okay. Can we leave it at that? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, but I have uh, other important... Well, I think we have some other questions here that we need to answer. Not other questions. What? Okay. No, no, I, I want to go to another question, okay? So we'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who else did we have? Uh, yes, right hi, uh, my name is Juan, and um, if I recall correctly, last year in 2014, uh, during a summit meeting uh, between Obama and President Park Geun-hye, uh, President Obama hoped for better Korea and Japan relations. <coughs> But as Mr. Cha has said, um, President Park has been really leaning towards China and signing a free trade agreement. And uh, I believe also she's trying to um, touch up on history, stay control of history. Also, uh, so it, that's kind of a really sensitive topic. Wouldn't that like, further deteriorate both relations between Korea and Japan? Okay, and I'm gonna go with one more in this round. And that, Matt, did you have a question over here? Did you have a question? Oh, no, sorry, okay. Um, maybe, oh. Right there. Okay. I'm sorry, we'll get you next round and, and Ezra next round. <coughs> no, I think we're here first. Please. Professor Vogel, please go. No, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stefan Rimner, I'm um, here at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at, at Columbia University. Um, I uh, wondered whether the, um, the panelists could offer their thoughts, uh, perhaps very briefly, <laughs> on, the, uh, on the, one of the most disruptive forces, of course, in the East Asian region, which is the, the history disputes. And um, in particular, I wondered about the specific problem, problem that the disputes over nationalism seem to move in a, re in, in a self-reinforcing cycle. So that no statement or no so-called revisionism is ever a revisionism <coughs> in the self-perception of any government, but governments always claim to be responding to someone else's nationalism. So that seems uh, to constitute this this, this cycle of, of nationalist competition. And I was wondering whether you see any particular uh, role for policymakers um, to decrease the symbolism of history disputes and increase the symbolism of economic and financial uh, uh, cooperation that um, you've explained during this panel. Thank you. Okay, Bob, do you wanna handle the first question on oh. the... On the Korea, Japan, and of this possible okay. this, the stages of development? Right. Well, you know, I think that's absolutely right. And the cooperative stage is what I was talking about. That is true. As, of course, countries develop, many things happen. One is the role of the state becomes so much less important. And then you have a, what we would call a normal market-driven competition. And the fact that they're competing for the same markets, I think, is frankly not a big deal. In other words, they're just, they're just economic competitors, right? In other words, if you think back on the U.S.-Japan uh, 1980s, 1990s disputes, I mean, right, it did seem like it was going to be you know, something so much bigger, um, but we were just basically economic competitors, I think. And you know, the, the amazing thing, where I was talking to you the other day, it, the economic disputes with Japan have gone to zero. Um, and you know, my students today just can't believe that at one point Japan was the big threat. You know, they just don't believe it because it's nothing now. 
So to answer your question, yes, I think the important thing is, remember, this is a development model. And I, the reason I'm a bit optimistic is I think China is still in that phase, the earlier phase. I don't think it has graduated yet. Um, it is moving up, of course, it's huge. It has so much more to go, and I think the government is still sort of heavily involved. And because they need the markets and, to a lesser degree, uh, investment in technology, uh, I think it, that is still sort of a continuity. So. Um, Victor, you knew I was going to do this to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> On Japan ROK relations and the disharmony and the Obama Park Summit. Um, yeah, so uh, the... Um I guess a couple of things. The first is that on, on the um, um, there was mention of Wendy Sherman's speech. The I can't remember the exact. I think it was 2008. There was another incident where the um, uh, uh, um, BGN Board of Geographical Names changed uh, designation for the Lianco rocks fr um, from um, Korean to disputed territory. Um, <clears throat> and uh, no one had in their life had ever heard of BGN before this controversy. <laughs> um, and a decision was made by the President of the United States to change it back, right, from disputed to Korean territory. So. I think for every example of what looks like favoritism towards Japan, there are other examples that look like uh, siding with Korea. And in the end, I think it's like you have two, you know, it's like you have two arms. Which would you like to cut off, right? I mean, that, I think that's the way the United States feels about Korea and Japan. On the Korea-China relationship, I think, um, I think everybody sees the, the Koreans getting closer to the Chinese. I would like to emphasize for this audience, I don't think that is a direct function of the difficulties with Japan. I do not think that's the reason. I think the main reason that President Park is getting closer to China has very little to do with Japan and everything to do with North Korea. Uh, because uh, you know she has met with Xi Jinping eight or nine times. They have a very good personal relationship. Xi Jinping actually looks very he act, looks like he has a crush on Park Geun-hye. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think she's doing all this to really try to move the needle with China when it comes to North Korea because she sees, I think, a moment. Now, whether this strategy works, we don't know. I think, for one, uh, the, the China-Korea relationship has really not been tested by North Korea yet. We haven't seen a missile test or a provocation that, would, that we would see where, what, 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 what uh, side China, China came, uh, was on. Um, and the other element of Park Geun-hye's policy is this effort at Northeast Asian cooperation, right? something called NAPSI, the Northeast Asian Peace and Cooperation Initiative. But the big flaw in that strategy is that how can you talk about Northeast Asian cooperation without talking about cooperation with Japan? Uh, and so that's always been a big space in the strategy. On the history versus economics narrative, I think there have been efforts to try to change the narrative. Um, um, one version is this term called the Asia paradox, right, which is this notion of a region of the world where uh, you have incredible economic cooperation, growth, interdependence, uh, but these have not led to a diminution of the security tensions or the historical tensions. Uh, TPP in many ways is uh, another potential um, and probably the most important legacy of the Obama administration's rebalance to Asia. Uh, uh, which is all about the uh, the trade and the uh, financial side than than it is about uh, about security and and I would agree with Bob I think um, uh, one of the first countries that will join TPP uh, will be Korea and then I think uh, you know so at some point maybe in our lifetimes uh, China as well although that will be a, that's a long road that's a long road to hoe. Yeah, with regard to the the uh, notion of Korea leaning towards China apart from the United States, well, it may be true perceptionally, whereas Professor Jarvis has just left, but uh, uh, in terms of empirical data, uh, for example, the frequency of uh, joint military exercises, military personnel exchanges, and uh, the number of classes opening my university taught in English, all data shows 
Uh, if I describe the relations with uh, comparing with the triangular love affairs, Korea is strongly holding Washington's hands, but sometimes uh, send love signals to China. That may be a most appropriate description of what the, uh, the South Korea's position between the United States and China. Uh, I'm just going to just add one word on the, the history disputes because I think it's very important. Um, <laughs> I remember reading Victor's book a long time ago, and uh, you know he talks about how the um, Japan and the ROK, their uh, the, the distance between them varies according to the U.S. security commitment. Um, what, you, is, what that sort of tells me is what you need to get overcome these history issues is some sort of imperative, something that is more important than uh, these domestic history issues that continually bollocks up the relationship. Um, the problem is, uh, you know, the U.S. obviously with its rebalance is, is kind of looking like it's trying to assure East Asia of its commitment to the region. So that's not going to be, you know, the U.S. leaving the region, forcing Japan and the ROK to, to get together, that really isn't going to be the, the imperative, I don't think. Um, the other possibility is a united perception toward China. You know, having uh, Japan and the ROK both feel really uh, concerned about uh, what China is doing. And as Bob was explaining, that can be very problematic. Suppose Japan and Korea did share that view and, you know, was kind of <coughs> united with the United States. I mean, the, the perception from Beijing would be, oh my God, you know, this really is containment uh, in a new form. And, uh, you know, you'll see even stronger Chinese efforts to to defend its own uh, interests. So that isn't necessarily a good thing. So the problem is that you, you, you come back to this situation where without these sort of imperatives, the best you can hope for is enlightened leadership that occasionally can push these uh, history issues to the side. Uh, unfortunately, as I think we, the panelists have said, we don't have that leadership right now. We have two, in fact, probably the worst two leaders you could imagine mm -hmm. for shunting aside history issues. And so really, uh, it may be that th our best hope is to make do, hold on, and wait for new politicians to come to the fore who can at least try to put some of these issues to the side. Because even if they reached an agreement on comfort women, there's plenty of other issues that could uh, dis <coughs> dis uh, that, that could derail uh, the uh, uh, Japan ROK relationship. So let me uh, talk to this woman and then to, to Ezra Vogel and then we'll do a couple more. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Harriet Mandel. I'm from SEPA and uh, the Global Roundtable. And I, I'm just so curious, there's a tiny little dot in the regional map which hasn't even been referred to and that's Taiwan. And I'm just wondering if it's not a factor or how it is a factor, particularly in, uh, in the China relationship um, with Japan and the region. Professor Volk. Professor Volk, Harvard University. Uh, I want to build on uh, Babu Yu's uh, comment about the fact that these East Asia economies have really used the same kind of developmental model and have a lot of interaction. And to me, the big issue from here on is how we go from kind of a anti-Chinese uh, mood uh, and uh, maybe not alliance, but spirit, uh, to multilateral institutions that involve all these countries. And um, when I've talked to some young Japanese recently, about uh, the question of AIB. They say that, you know, Japanese ought to be willing to start cooperating and giving technical advice. They can't join it right away, but aren't there things that they can do to show that they're receptive and begin to work with it? And I like Victor's uh, comment uh, that the TPP, maybe someday China will join, and that it was wrong for us not to be more positive to AIB. So what can we do now to push toward sort of better cooperation in these institutions? How, how can we get you know, China and Korea and Japan and the United States all working together? Uh, what, what are some steps we might take? 
uh, to get us into the same institutions. I'm sorry, I miscalculated the time, so I think we're going to have to leave it at those two questions. Uh, so, uh, Bob, do you want to start off on the multilateral issue? Yeah, th that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, uh, when we talk about you know power transition and the rising hegemon and you know the inevitable conflict, it's always the sense that um, you know the inevitability has to do with neither side bending or accommodating. And I've always felt that it is really more in our interest, American interest, to be a little bit less inflexible. And again, you know the. Uh, you know, I, I know we, we disagreed a bit about you know, how important the role setting is. And of course it's important on a certain level and we're going to fight for it. I mean, I have no doubt about that. But to let it become more of a, you know, again, sort of a clash kind of thing, that's what we need to avoid. But how to get that accommodation through America's politics, how to you know, have the Chinese and the Japanese somehow agree to put aside you know, to agree to cooperate on where they can cooperate, that's very, very difficult. I wish I knew the answer, actually. Uh, let me just make some final remarks on Taiwan, because I think it's important. Uh, Taiwan um, is, I think, in some ways, a chip that Mr. Abe holds in his back pocket. Uh, as you, people are probably aware, the DPP is almost certainly going to win the next presidential election. The DPP has traditionally been very close to Japan. Um, it, I don't think it was any uh, surprise that immediately after Tsai Ing-wen's uh, trip to, uh, uh, to Japan and her not-so-secret meeting with Prime Minister Abe, that suddenly you had a lot of Chinese attention to Japan. And suddenly a high-ranking official was over in Japan, just all of a sudden. So I think that Taiwan is, uh, in some ways, uh, Mr. Abe's leverage. He can use it. Uh, he's not going to, to provoke the Chinese on this sort of He knows how strongly the Chinese feel about it. But he's going to hold it in his back pocket and say, you know, if things get really bad, you know, Taiwan and Japan share enormous security and economic interests. There is a lot of reasons why they would want to be uh, closer. And so the, uh, Beijing, knowing that, will will probably uh, be forced to back off at least a little bit. Uh, with that, I'm going to close uh, and uh, open the floor to Jerry Curtis to make some closing remarks. Well, I think this has just been a wonderful, wonderful afternoon, and I'm uh, uh, you know, I've been thinking, once I decided that I was going to retire, and as this semester was winding down, <coughs> it led me to kind of spend a lot of time looking back on my career um, and thinking about what's been really most gratifying, most important to me uh, over the 47 years that I've been, uh, I've been teaching at Columbia and working on Japan and traveling back and, back and forth between the two countries. And there are many things, but we don't have any, we, I don't have, there isn't a lot of time, and I wanted to say, talk just a word about what's been the most important, the most gratifying aspect of my career. And that's been the students that uh, I've um, obviously seemed to have scared. <laughs> uh, but that I, I, I also helped uh, train, and that I've seen uh, mature into the leading intellectuals dealing with East Asia uh, uh, in this current generation. And so, you know, for me, uh, listening uh, to all of these um, uh, people today uh, speak here with such expertise and, um, uh, and insight, uh, there's nothing more as a, you know, as a retiring professor that you can uh, really be, be gratified by than watching these people in action. So I want to thank each and every one of them who, uh, who spoke today. And I have other students in the audience. And we could have had a two or three day uh, seminar easily and covered a lot of other <coughs> issues as well. Because the study, you know, the study of Japan uh, at this university uh, has been um, uh, 
I say this university has been, I think, I think it's been the major center outside of Japan itself for the study of Japan. In fact, it's, it's, it's so important in the study of Japan that we have lots of Japanese students who come here to study about Japan, uh, uh, get a different perspective than you, than you get uh, back at home. So <clears throat> that's really uh, wonderful. And I was thinking too, what are the issues that this generation of Japan scholars, East Asian scholars, and the coming generations of East Asian scholars should be talking about? Because they're different than when I was, uh, you know, 40 <coughs> years ago, uh, and different from what it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, so what are the issues now? Well, I think it's, indic it's, it's, kind of, it, it's, uh, it's clear from the, the focus of the conversation today that one of the most important driving issues is about Japan's role in the region and where the region is going and how the region is going to deal uh, with Japan. <clears throat> so in a, just a few minutes, let me suggest uh, four or five areas that I think uh, uh, need a lot of attention and I've, I'm not getting sufficient attention yet. One is the the fundamental change that has occurred in the Japanese domestic political system over the last two decades. Today, uh, we didn't have much talk about uh, political parties, political organization, the relationship between the ruling party and the LDP, I mean, and the opposition, the, between the LDP and the opposition. But <clears throat> where this, the, the kind of the dynamics of Japanese domestic politics today are in many ways fundamentally different from what it was when a number of you took my course <coughs> 20 years or more ago. There has been an extraordinary concentration of power in the office of the prime minister. Uh, the prime minister, or the Kante, the prime minister's uh, headquarters, it controls the cabinet. This was not true in the past when the cabinet was kind of a collective decision-making uh, body. And cabinet ministers were sort of the CEO of their ministry. And the prime minister was kind of the chairman of the board of the whole operation. Uh-uh. Mr. Abe is the CEO. He's in charge. And no cabinet minister is going to speak out of school, say things that the prime minister is not going to like. And he wouldn't last. And they don't last. But, but they do last because they stick with Abe's uh, agenda. Uh, he is com the, the, the the Prime Minister's office is in control of the party. It's not the kind of, co co of co coordination between very powerful party institutions and party leaders and the executive, the Prime Minister's office. This Prime Minister runs the LDP and the LDP does what the Prime Minister wants him to do. There's been a change in the relationship between the Prime Minister's office and the bureaucracy. Japanese bureaucracy is very strong, but the and, and the bureaucrats have always been sensitive to what politicians need need to have happen. But <coughs> the autonomy of the bureaucracy, I think, has been uh, has been much more constrained. And one of the interesting examples is the power of the National Security Council. I don't think any of us could have expected that an NSC inside the Prime Minister's office would be able to coordinate the defense ministry, the foreign ministry, other ministries, and actually play the kind of role that it plays, say, in the United States. But that's a big change. There are, so for, those who, for the younger students in the audience who are thinking, well, thank God I don't have to do my dissertation under Jerry Curtis. <laughs> But when you think about, if you're thinking about doing graduate work and doing dissertation, what explains these changes? What do these changes mean in terms of the dynamics of political action? What do they mean in terms of Japanese democracy? One of the really, one of, so, so one of the concerns about Japanese democracy is the utter weakness and the disarray in the opposition camp. Uh, Mr. Abe is a very strong prime minister, and that's in some ways very good, but it's not good not to have any strong competition 
not to have any other leaders in the LDP who compete with them, not to have any opposition parties that stand a reasonable chance of coming to power, not to have any opposition parties that know what they want to do that's different from what Mr. Abe wants to do. You know, all this talk about the national security legislation and, and uh, uh, the opposition to it uh, from the DPJ and so on, <laughs> You know, I was watching, I was in Japan a good part of that time, you watch on TV these DPJ diet members who I know well and who, if anything, are as, at least as far on the right in terms of their hawkish views as the LDP with a straight face saying that this legislation is, uh, is, is dangerous. No, this is not real. This is not real. This is, this is pure politics. This is irresponsible politics. So the problem for the political opposition in Japan is what are they opposed to? What do they support? What do they offer that the LDP doesn't offer? If they don't come up with an answer, that is not uh, a good message. A good, a good, uh, that is not good for, for Japan's democracy. And finally, and I'll move on. <clears throat> the old system, which I've written so much about, the LDP uh, before 2000 or so, the old, the old system had a system, it was a system, there was a, an inherent system of checks and balances. Factions balanced the, 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 the Kante, the prime, the prime minister's power. Uh, the opposition, especially when the socialists were strong, this goes way back, but in the 60s and 70s, they couldn't come to power, but they could surely put a break on a lot of things that the LDP wanted to do. That's why Mr. Abe is still trying to do what his grandfather wanted to do in the late 1950s as far as, as, far as constitutional re revision and so on. The agenda hasn't changed. If anything, the agenda has gone back to what it was 40 years ago. But, the, but now he has a chance of actually doing some things because the, the checks and balances are weaker. That's one big area that, you know, Nobody is working on it. It's extraordinary. No one is working on these questions of fundamental questions about the functioning of Japan's political democracy. The second is, again, about domestic, domestic politics. And that is the politics of policy uh, in, a society, in a country where the economy is, is and will continue to grow and to grow slowly. Many years ago, Jim probably doesn't, may not remember this, but you wrote a paper at the, Sh I don't know, at the Shimoda conference, must have been in 1970 or 69 or 70. And I remember the title of it was Growth for What? Remember writing that paper? You wrote this paper, Growth for What? And that is a good question to ask about Japan today. How do you get economic growth and the growth for what? Japan faces new kinds of problems. Social inequality is a real growing issue in Japan. Uh, the gap between really very rich people and very poor people. Uh, 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 the whole problem of the policy issues relating to aging, to an aging population. The extraordinary cost of medical insurance. Pensions. How are you going to pay f for this? Uh, so there's a welfare programs. You know, Hugh mentioned about 60% of the Japanese uh, labor force is employed in full-time jobs where you kind of assume that unless the company is really in desperate shape, the last, th the last thing, you know, in the U.S., the first thing you do is lay off a fire in Japan, so the last thing you do is lay off a fire. But it, it is changing, and job security is becoming less and less certain. But the, the welfare <coughs> programs for the unemployed long-term unemployment insurance and so on, are very backward in Japan. How do you pay for it? In short, these, there's a lot of issues of political economy which are not, of the, issue, not the issues of the political economy that was studied in the, 19, in the 1980s when it was, well, we'll go, you, 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 know, you know it was because a number of you worked on it. It's a new set of issues. They're not getting sufficient attention. The third is the changing character of Japanese political leadership. Someone asked earlier, uh, you know, Abe's at least two arrows of the three haven't really hit the target, uh, yet Abe is popular. Why is he popular? The answer is quite simple. No one can imagine that somebody else in office would do a better job than Mr. Abe. That is the reason. Uh, so 
if you ask on public, you know, in these public opinion polls, do you feel the, 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 the positive benefits of Abenomics? 70%, 80% of the Japanese respondents say, no, I don't feel it. Do you support Mr. Abe? Yes. <laughs> and uh, do you support his, his uh, national security legislation? No. But do you want to continue in office? Yes. <clears throat> what does that reflect? That reflects the lack of options. That reflects a sense that you, whatever disappointment you might have in this prime minister, it has to be better than having a revolving door prime minister where every year somebody else comes into office and by the time he, figure, he starts to get an idea of what he might, how to, how to do things, he's out. No one wants to go back to that uh, period from Koizumi uh, to, uh, to second, term, second term Abe. But in the old days, and I'm nostalgic for the old days for, lots of re for, for many reasons, but the, one of them being in the old days, the system really worked. The Japanese system worked from around 1990 or so, then it became a new issue. The system doesn't work, why? Well, the system of leadership recruitment worked and anybody who became prime minister in Japan had been finance minister or meeting minister, had been secretary general of the party, had held major positions so that he was really trained to, 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 to be the top leader and people who became leading members of, of, in the government similarly were well trained. That's no longer the case. So the whole process of how you recruit leaders, very different now. And I'm very struck by so many young Japanese politicians. As I put it, it sounds better in Japanese than it does in English somehow, but they don't smell like politicians. <laughs> because they're policy wonks. And they can bore you to death. And they go on TV and they bore the audience to death with technical discussions of some tax issue or another. That's not the role of politicians. The role of politicians is to present a big picture, to try to get the public to understand what are the major choices the country has to make. So I'm concerned about the quality of, uh, of political uh, leadership, uh, leadership in, in, in Japan. And I think it's a, we have a, a common issue, whether it be in Europe, in Britain, in the United States, God only knows, or in Japan about the lack of qualified and attractive political leaders. What explains this, uh, th this situation? I think that's an area of research that simply is not being, being um, uh, engaged in enough. Finally, and I only got a minute left, uh, the, big, <coughs> the, the big area and the big elephant in the room are security policy is the big area. And the big elephant in the room is China. And so we need more uh, uh, systematic research on issues of Japanese security policy. I would say, first of all, I completely agree with what I think was a unanimous view on this panel that the new that the national leg uh, security legislation uh, that passed this summer does not represent a departure in any shape or form from post-war Japanese security policy. Japanese security policy has been evolving constantly. Gra uh, gradually, cautiously, for decades, and it has evolved further with this, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, um, uh, legislation. But there is a new dynamic in U.S.-Japan relations. We worry about getting entangled in some issue that we didn't create. That is a conflict between China and Japan. Why did the U.S. Ex express? A, issue a statement of disappointment over, Yas of, over Abe's Yasukuni visit. It was not about war criminals, not for us. It was for the Koreans and the Chinese, but for the US it was, it was very simple. And it was stated. It was because that action raised tensions in East Asia. And raising tensions complicates our policies in dealing with China and with the region, region as a whole. So that requires a lot more. We have to recognize that the dynamic of the relationship has changed. Japanese worry, I wouldn't say abandonment, but they worry about how reliable the American commitment the commitment is. So you can't leave this relationship on automatic pilot. There has to be more attention given to coordinating, uh, communicating, and, and coordinating. Fi and on that, but on, on, on that point, I think there's been a very important change on the right wing, in the right wing, in the LDP. The right wing in the LDP has long advocated a more autonomous Japanese security policy. I believe, except for some crazies, way out on the far right, 
whose names I won't mention in this for, for now. But except for people way, way out, the right wing or the, the, the more conservative element in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the LDP recognizes there is no way for Japan to have a defense without an alliance with the United States. The support for the alliance for the United States has spread across the political spectrum much more widely than ever before, both to the left and to the right. So I don't worry about autonomy unless the Japanese conclude that we're really incapable and unwilling to fulfill our commitments. That is not going to happen. We will fill our commitments, assuming that Donald Trump doesn't become pre president of the United States. <laughs> so finally, the issue is how do we deal with China? That will be the dominant, the dominant issue for decades to come in East Asia. And I think the answer is a simple, not, it's not a simple answer, but the answer includes two key elements. We have to maintain a balance of power in East Asia. That is not containment of China, but it is a balance against China. And the US has to play the key role in doing that. And along with that, we have to provide international space, space for China to participate as a leader in international organizations. You can't say to the Chinese, don't, you know, we're not going to give you the space. We're not going to reform the IMF. We're not going to change the, 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 give you more role, more, bigger role in the World Bank. We're not going to alternate the presidency of the ADP between Japan and, and, and China. But don't you dare go and form the AIIB. If we don't give China space, they will carve out a space for themselves. So there's a big agenda uh, uh, of, of research to be done. These are the people who are going to lead lead the effort and they're going to ha they have students and they're going to get their students uh, to do uh, to do more of, of in this area and so I'm very optimistic about the future and I thank all of you each and every one of you for coming today and for sharing this wonderful occasion with me thank you I'm Andy Nathan, and I uh, had the pleasure of working with Bill and Sheila <clears throat> in organizing this event. And I just want to make a few quick thank yous. First, to the organizations that have co-sponsored the event, the School of International and Public Affairs. Our Dean Merritt Jano is back here, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. <laughs> <clears throat> The, the Office of the Provost, uh, the Political Science Department, Arts and Sciences, and, uh, and, and Hugh Patrick's Center for Japanese Economy and Business. Thank you, Hugh. Um, my thanks uh, to uh, the panelists. They came from some far away places, uh, Washington, D.C., which is very far from New York. <laughs> Ohio, uh, California, uh, Singapore. Uh, Pungar came from Singapore with his wife and, and daughter all the way. And uh, Yung Ho Kim arrived at JFK this morning and um, with his wife and son, because he couldn't leave Yonsei until, when I don't know the time difference, but until then and got stuck in traffic in Manhattan, and he made it to his panel. So thank you so much. And I share with Jerry the, the sense of being so impressed with uh, Jerry's uh, uh, children, stepchildren, illegitimate children, <laughs> and all the uh, clan that he has, uh, I'm going to would say spawned, but I'm not going to say that. Um, and I'd like to thank the audience. You've been very, very engaged and interested, and this is an extremely distinguished audience, so we're grateful for you to come. And finally, I want to thank the staff of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute who did the work for this. And um, there, many of them are here right now. I can't um, take the time to acknowledge each of them, but I will just acknowledge Catherine Forche, who is our, who's not here right now, because she's in the next venue, I think, who um, uh, 
arranged this very uh, uh, well thought out schedule that I've been enforcing in the back going like this. And Sarah Kirsch, who's been sort of in charge of the crew that's here on the scene, thanks to the staff. Now those, yes. <laughs> Those of us who are signed up for the dinner should proceed forthwith because time continues to be pressing as we have a lot more talking to do to the faculty house. So you got to go down the elevator to the fourth floor and through the building and uh, ask people where the hell is faculty house. And I'll see you over there. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>